that investigate, investigate in one way or another the social context of work to postpone age-related ill health. Uh, Didier Cornell is a lawyer from Belgium who is prominent in an organization, a grassroots organization working in this area. And I am delighted to have him on stage for 10 minutes. Uh, yeah, it's okay. Okay, uh, working? Yeah. This, this uh, short speech will be about the advantages of a longer and healthier life, but the advantages for the society, not for you and for me. So, if it accepts to work. Okay. So the, the first point is, of course, the, fa the fact that uh, a society with people with a longer and healthier li life uh, are more active. So as you know, the level of activity of older people when they are healthier can reach. Uh, the, and so globally, with a higher life expectancy, you can have a bigger part of the population and not a smaller part of the population uh, being active because they are proportionally less children. Of course, this means that you have a rising pension age, but I will go back to this a little bit later. As uh, you know, each week we are winning more or less a small weekend of life at the moment. And uh, life expectancy in good health is also very cle clearly rising. If you take a look at some uh, statistics uh, like uh, Eurostat, you have not very reliable uh, statistics, but the general, uh, uh, general image is very clear the life expectancy in good health is also rising. The fact, the fact that life expectancy is rising means, of course, less deaths each year. And it means, and that is the important point economically, less people in the last year of their life. Why is this important? Because even for all people, here you have a comparison, uh, comparison for the uh, mean annual medical expenditures in the U USA at the end of the, of, uh, during the years 90, between a normal year and the last year of their, of their, life, of their life, it's a real a huge difference. And so if you win each year three months of life expectancy, you go more or less in terms of global mass from this to this. And if the work of people like you and the work of uh, uh, Oboe, thank you Oboe, uh, is really working, we will go from this to this. Okay, so it's a huge economical advantage. The next point is about uh, the uh, pension age. So uh, you can have only uh, more activity of healthy uh, people living longer if you have a p the pension age rising. As you very probably know, there are differences between uh, various categories of people. And one of the big differences is between rich people and poor people. So for me, it will be uh, socially uh, a question of equity and also to make it possible to have the pension age rising, to have something like the pension age rising first for the richer people, for people with higher pensions, and then for the others. Uh, at the moment, there is no country, in, no country in the world you have this link between pension age and the rising of life expectancy. That's funny. You have a, only one country when there is a small part of uh, life expectancy taken in consideration, but really pension age and life expectancy, nowhere. Uh, the, the big question of overpopulation. As uh, Dr. Le Leonid Gravilov uh, told you, uh, if you were here two years ago, if you take the population in Sweden and that you imagine uh, uh, this country without mortality uh, due to old age, so if the people after the, the, the age of 50 years don't uh, die more than uh, they would die before 50 years, uh, you see uh, on the horizontal, year, uh, the horizontal line, pardon, 2005-2055, uh, the difference between the two lines is the difference if, you, uh, if the mortality is the same after 50 years or if the mortality is uh, going normally. So you see that's only 2 million, all things being equal. But the important thing is that all things are not being equal. Here you have, uh, that's uh, from the, the website Gapminder that you maybe know, you have the comparison between 1955 
and, uh, and 2005 for the population of all countries in the world. And here you have the number of children per woman also, and here you have, uh, of course, life expectancy. And you see that when the life expectancy is rising, very, very clearly, the number of children per woman is going down. So, uh, for example, in China, but in China there was, a, of course, a compulsory, uh, China is here, right? Uh, China, that was a compulsory uh, one-child system, but also in India, for example, it's going from six to uh, already less than three. So it's really uh, life expectancy, uh, the, the rise of life expectancy means less children, and so less problem of uh, uh, overpopulation, and not more problem of, of, of overpopulation. The best example is that uh, the country, the, the part of the world where the population is rising uh, the fastest is uh, Africa, the blue countries here, so, uh, especially uh, the countries in uh, the south of Africa. Next point, there is a, a very uh, clear link between the life expectancy and uh, the, uh, the GDP, the, 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 richness, the, the, the richness of a, a country. So of course it's working uh, two, two ways, but you see, so here you have GDP, and here you have once again life expectancy. You see that there is a very uh, clear link between the two. Okay, no, no more economics, strictly economics, but uh, when you have a population advancing in age, a healthier population advancing in age, you have also a happier population. So there are studies about uh, when are people happy. They are happy when they are, when they are young. They are less happy when they are 30, 40. And after that, there is a U-curve. After that, the, the people are against happier. So this means globally, when you have a population uh, advancing in age, in good health, the population is more happy. And that's, of course, good for the society as a whole. And it's also good because it means less risk of uh, disruptive attitudes. And I'm going back, I'm going now to the next point. The, uh, the wisdom does not necessarily come with age, but when you take a look at statistics concerning crime, you have what's called the crime curve age. And here, that's the situation. So here, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, the, the, that's called the crime curve age. And you see that the, the people, young people, uh, the, so here, 20 years, that's really the, the top time uh, to commit uh, crimes, and it's going, it's going down very, very, very fast, and not because the people are less healthy, but just because with age, well, comes a little bit of wisdom. Okay, and also, that's logical. Uh, like uh, Sonia, I think, said, uh, when life is longer, you tend to be more careful not to lose it. When life is longer, it appears to be a lot more precious, and for me, the Oh, the, uh, you, I, I take always also the example of uh, um, infanticide. So killing children two centuries ago was, well, it was a crime, but that was not so, such bad a crime because a lot of children were dying. So when life is longer, it appears to be a, a lot more precious. And of course, like Sonia said, there is a fairly important link between life expectancy and sustainable development because when you live a lot longer, you know that you have to take care, not only for your children, but also for yourself. Okay, and there is a general uh, principle, I think, of equality in the society. So there is a general principle there, there is a big consensus between uh, man and woman. There is a maybe less big consensus, but still between uh, rich and poor people. There is uh, also a consensus uh, between uh, people from all origins. And there is no, not yet, but I hope that you are here for this, also not yet a consensus for uh, equality between uh, pigeons and human beings, but uh, for, and also not for equality between uh, all older people or people advancing in age and younger pe people. And frankly, each time that I'm uh, in my native home, uh, s that I see very old people uh, walking very slowly and painfully to go to the food store, I really think that we should do something, and if we can do something, we, we should do it, okay, in the uh, scientific fields and also in the social and political fields. Okay, the last, uh, the last slide with, uh, with the graph is this one. That's, uh, uh, there are a lot of people saying, yeah, but it's that, that's not so important because in the South, the people are still uh, dying of uh, hunger and so on. 
Well, of course, that's true for uh, a small part of, well, it's true for a part of Africa, but here you have the two, uh, one of the poorest uh, countries in the world, Bangladesh, and uh, you have also China, and on the other side you have the United States and my funny vanishing country, Belgium, okay, and you see the evolution between 1960 uh, and, uh, and now, and you see, so the, the GDP here, there are still huge differences, but concerning the life, extens uh, the life expectancy, uh, the difference is really uh, becoming very, uh, very small. For me, one uh, characteristic uh, is, well, two, two, two precise points. For example, in Bangladesh, the life expectancy was, was rising 12 years, the last 25 years. And for example, in uh, Peking, the life expectancy is no Peking capital of uh, China, of course, is now uh, higher than the life expectancy in Washington, capital of the United States. So in a sense, you can even say that uh, working for a, for a longer life expectancy is first, it first better for poor people than for rich people, in a sense. Okay, so uh, already my conclusion. I think that a society with more resilient people living a lot longer, people knowing that they will be able to go on for long if they care for themselves and for others, this, it, it is probably one of the nicest futures that we can imagine. So for you, for me, but that's not the most important for the society as a whole. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and we have time for a few questions for Didier. Um, great. Uh, I'm one thing I'm not quite sure I agree with you is this sort of U-shaped happiness curve. I mean, I mean, it's it's clearly true, but it's not clear whether the dip in the middle is because people in 30s and 40s are bringing up children and are therefore miserable, <laughs> um, or or whether people in their 50s and 60s are near the end of their professional career, looking forward to retirement, and therefore the career pressure is off. If it's the former, then um, as people get older and as life is extended, uh, you'll get more happy people. If it's the latter, then you'll push out retirement age and you'll get more miserable people and we'll be miserable until we're 60 or 70. Um, Aubrey can probably guess which side I'm on. Yeah, yeah okay. So first, uh, in a speech of 10 minutes, I just took the positive aspects and I don't have time to go into details, but you were right about the fact that, no, I think, you're probably right, and one of the explanations is maybe the fact that the people uh, have children. But still, when you take a look at all studies that I know, still the, there is a, the, the people going to 50, 60, 70 years are happier. And, well, to be honest, I never saw a study to know if, if the aspect of uh, children is the most important or not. And the children, the, the fact that children, it's not always... Uh, uh, well, that the, the fact the people think that they are happier with children, but they seem not to be happy. Okay, but to, to know if, uh, if it is the only element or not, you should have a study comparing people without children when they are older. And still, I think that, that still in the studies, uh, uh, happiness is, uh, is going up uh, when you get old. But I will not say that I'm 100% sure because I, I don't have the element. One more question. Yeah, there's but some pretty good so, studies. Sorry, but certainly it's not decreasing happiness, that's for sure. There, there's some pretty good studies from the 40s and 50s that suggest that at that point in history, about 35% of the population was self-identified uh, as happy. And uh, with the increase in, in um, uh, incomes and whatnot, that number has stayed pretty much constant. And what's your question? It's well, the, the point is, is that, it, that happiness is, is kind of genetically determined. People are kind of born happy, whether they're rich or poor or live long or whatever. Well, you it, can't buy happiness. Yeah, yeah it, it would be a longer discussion about happiness more than about uh, life extension. But okay, but still the fact, the fact is that uh, happiness is still rising when the people are advancing in the age at the end of the... So, and I think that it's also because you have more experience and so that you you learn to be happy uh, but okay but that's for sure that uh, the genetics are important and that's for sure also that uh, uh, when uh, it's only money until uh, well, there is this uh, limit of uh, 1500 uh, dollars a month after that you don't money is not enough to be more happy yeah it's another debate
So I'm sorry we don't have time for any more questions, but Didier is going to be here for the rest of the meeting, and he's got a lot more to say about this. Go ahead. Yeah, platform.